So growing up on a farm, my dad was the oldest of four brothers. Each of the brothers had a wife, and there were 14 grandchildren in my generation. So uh, when we all, except one of his brothers, went to the same church, and that brother didn't go to church when we were growing up, uh, and his family didn't go to church. But on Sunday afternoon, uh, after church, we all, we all went to church together. And then we would come back to my grandmother's house, my grandparents' house, and she would fix a big meal and we would sit in the dining room and in the kitchen, the, the older pe- people, my parents and that generation sat in the dining room and the kids sat in the kitchen and we ate together. And then, uh, after we ate together, the parents all retired to the living room or the family room and chatted and, and spent the afternoon visiting and being together. It's what I grew up doing every Sunday. And so the kids uh, didn't really like being a part of that adult talk. So we had our things that we did. We went to the that loft in the barn and played in the hay mow, only it was straw. It wasn't hay because we didn't have cows at that time, but we did have need for uh, straw. So we had straw bales and there were ropes that we would swing from uh one stack of hay to the straw to the next. And we did that. We played Red Rover, Red Rover, and we played Simon Says. Uh, anybody ever play Simon Says? Yeah. You know how it goes. Somebody's it and they're Simon. And Simon Says stands up in front of the group and says, Simon Says, touch your ear. And you t- everybody touches your ear and you go on and on. And, and, and Simon Says is a game where you have to listen And then you have to obey to what you hear. But if Simon doesn't say it, you don't do it, right? Because that's how you get out. If if Simon says, do this and do that and do this, and then all of a sudden the person who Simon says, touch your nose, and he didn't say Simon says, touch your nose, and you touch your nose, you're out. And the winner is the last one who is standing, who has listened and obeyed all of the instructions throughout that game. Obeying Simon is the key to winning the game. Obeying Jesus is key to following him. All throughout Christmas, this Christmas season, we have been looking at a series that I've called Christmas Postures, and I'm continuing it today and next week. We're still in the Christmas season. I know the stores have moved on to uh, Easter. I've seen several that Easter candy is up in already. It was up last week. But we are still in the Christmas season. And uh, I want to share with you a work that uh, Howard Thurman, who is an African-American theologian, educator, and civil rights leader, composed called The Work of Christmas. You've probably seen it. I saw it this week on Facebook attributed to someone else, but I did the research, and this is Howard Thurman's writing a number of years ago. He said, when the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flocks, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among the people, to make music in the heart. The work of Christmas has begun. And that's why we're still exploring Christmas postures this week and next. This week, the posture that we're exploring is called following. And next week, the posture that we will explore is serving. Our scripture passage for today holds a, in, in, an interesting story of Jesus and the, the, um, his teaching his disciples about the mission that he wants them to be on. Luke records it in Luke 5, 1 through 11, and Pastor Sharon read it this morning, and I don't know if you noticed, but as Jesus was standing there teaching the crowd, he was beside the sea, the Sea of Galilee. And the crowd was pressing in on him, and it was a great crowd, and so he was smart. He saw two boats, and he said to Simon Peter, the owner of one of the boats, Hey, 
can you take me out into the water? And so they got into the boat and Peter pushed off ashore a little ways. And I'm told that when you're there in the Sea of Galilee, if you if the crowd's up on the, the side of the, the sea on the bank, if you push out, someone talking from a boat can be heard better from a vast crowd. Kind of an amphitheater effect. And so that's what Jesus is doing. He's in this boat that Simon Peter owns. He and Simon Peter are in the boat and Jesus is teaching. And when he's done teaching, he says to Simon Peter, go out a little deeper to the deep water and put your nets down. Now, on one level, that's not an odd request to make of a professional fisherman. Simon Peter was a professional fisherman. He made his living fishing. But on another level, it was an odd request, and it felt that way to Simon Peter because Simon Peter had just come in from fishing all night, and he caught nothing. Zero. Zilch. Zip. Discouraging, for sure. And here's Jesus saying, yep, I want you to go out the deep waters and put your nets in the water. And Simon's like, but wait a minute. We did that. We didn't catch anything. What's going to change? We just came in. And so you see this odd exchange on one level and a normal exchange on another level. And then Simon says something that's key to our exploration of this passage this morning. After he protested just a little bit, and maybe he didn't protest, maybe it was just making a statement. I read it as a protest because you know Simon. I mean, Peter is the impetuous one. He's the one who stands up and says, I'll defend you to the end. And then he denies Jesus three times. I mean, you know, he's the one who jumps in the water when he, he thinks it's Jesus on the shore. Later in John, we read that. So anyhow, I read it into Simon saying, but wait a minute, we, we already fished in those waters and we didn't catch anything. I'm saying that's a little bit of a protest, but maybe it's not. Maybe Peter's just letting Jesus know what he thinks Jesus doesn't know. But he doesn't protest long if he's protesting, and he doesn't stay with that very long. He says these important words. He says, if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. If you say so, I'll do what you say. I'll let the nets down again. Those words are a key principle in following Jesus. You see, Jesus is looking for our obedience. I have a friend who says all the time, your job, she says this to me, she says this to lots of people, your job as a follower of Jesus is to be obedient. And Jesus will do everything else. All you have to do is do what he tells you to do. And he'll take care of the rest. You see, following Jesus is not a label that we wear, brothers and sisters. And if you've been around here any length of time, you know I say that frequently. It's not this label. It's a way of life. And obeying what Jesus calls us to do, to say, to be, is a part of following Jesus. It's a key part of following Jesus. And sometimes we may not be able to see in our minds because they're too small. And I've had those experiences where I felt nudged to do something by Jesus and I couldn't see it because my mind was too small and I resisted it. I mean, that's part of what's going on with Peter. He just fished. And Jesus says, go out to the deep water and put your net down. And Peter's saying, but wait, we just did that. We fished all night and we didn't catch anything. He can't see what Jesus is going to do. And sometimes we may not be able to see what he's calling us to do with our eyes. But if we take that step of obedience, he will do his work. 
Because look what happens when Peter, Simon Peter, is obedient. When he pushes the boat out a little farther and lets down the nets. Did you catch it when Pastor Sharon read it? Joy did. I heard her chuckle. They caught so many fish that the net started to tear and they called for the other boat that was along shore, their partners in his fishing venture, James and John, two more disciples of Jesus, to come and help them. And they got so many fish that the boat was so full, both boats were so full that they almost sank. Now, how's that for not catching any fish all night? You see, our job is to obey Jesus and he will do the rest. You can't blame Simon Peter because he was a professional fisherman. He had fished those waters and he knew in his mind, you don't go back out and fish right away because you're not going to catch anything. But when he obeyed, Jesus opened his eyes in a big way. You see, a key component to following, to following Jesus is obeying Jesus. Now, I'm not making a political statement when I say this, uh, but I, I, I love this quote by Cory Booker. And you can't read what I'm about to say either way. So don't read anything into it. I'm just telling you, Cory Booker wrote this quote and I like it. Before you speak to me, he says, about your religion, first show it to me in how you treat other people. Before you tell me how much you love your God, show me in how much you love all of his children. Before you preach to me of your passion for your faith, teach me about it through your compassion for your neighbors. In the end, I'm not as interested in what you have to tell or sell as I am in how you choose to live and give. I like that. That's what Jesus is saying here in this passage. Following him is about obeying. It's not a label. Yes, I'm a Christian, but if I don't live as a Christian, I'm not a Christian. This year as a congregation, we did something different for Christmas Eve. And you could say, well, we had no choice. It was either do something different or not do anything at all. Because that's kind of where we were. We we don't have, didn't have musicians that were available to lead our Christmas Eve service now that Doug and Sally have retired and moved to Virginia. By the way, we saw them on break and they said hi. They're six minutes from Sharon's sister where they live. Sharon's sister lives on the top of a hill and you can look down that hill and almost see Doug and Sally's if there wasn't another hill that hides their house. And they miss you guys. And they sent their love. So this year as a congregation... We didn't have musicians, and so we were struggling with what to do. And at the point we were struggling with what to do, I was really feeling it one day. Into the coffee shop walked Leslie McGinnity from Beyond Your Walls. And she said, hey, Pastor Martin, we did this last year at Christmas. We hosted a Christmas party for the homeless and people who wouldn't have anywhere to spend Christmas Eve. Wonder if you would let us use your facility. Talk about God nudging. And I said, yes, I'm all in, but let me, let me talk to my leadership team and see where we are. And so we talked to the leadership team and, um, we struggled. We struggled with whether we would do it or not. I'm going to be honest. It, it wasn't, uh, you, you know, and we struggled, struggled with details and how would it look and, and, and how would we fit all the people and, and, and what about if, People sat on chairs that they, you know, sometimes homeless people can't get to bathrooms. You know, how would we handle all of those things? We talked about some of those things. But in the end, we decided to go forward with it. Even though some of us weren't sure what it would look like and weren't sure how it would turn out. And we partnered with Beyond Your Walls and we didn't have all the details. It drove some of us crazy. I was like, 
I, I met with both Leslie and Angie and I was like, you got to tell me what you want to do. You know, I've got candles for candle lighting. Do I need them? You know, what, what do you want to, how do you want this night to look? And they were like, well, we don't want to plan it. We just want to follow the Spirit's lead and let it happen. We want to have food. We want to have a big feast. We want to invite our friends that we think wouldn't have a place to spend Christmas. And, and we want to let God do the rest. And so I said, okay, we'll go along with that. It's uncomfortable territory for some of us, but we'll go along with that. And I want to tell you that in all of my 55 years, almost 55 years, I'll be 55 in May. It's the most meaningful Christmas Eve service I can ever remember that we had. And it was a resounding, similar response from all of us that I heard from who came. Both the guests and those from Community of Joy. Now, I didn't talk to everybody from Community of Joy, so I'm not saying that it was unanimously resounding meaningful for everybody. There may have been someone who was here that it wasn't meaningful for, but by and large, the majority of us who were here had a very meaningful time, and our guests did as well. And why am I telling you that? Because obedience is key to following Jesus. Jesus was nudging us to do something with our facility, and we obeyed. And it was a beautiful night. And it touched people's lives. And we had more food than we could consume. But the ladies from beyond your walls had containers. And we sent containers home. And we sent food home. Nothing went to waste. And it blessed people beyond measure. In response to the sermon that I preached, Christmas postures and yielding was the posture. I confess to you that at the end of that sermon, I was feeling a nudge that we should step up and take a third week hosting the shelter. It made no sense, absolutely no sense in my mind for us to do that because when we take two weeks, and we've taken two weeks since 2008, But every year that I've been the coordinator and every year that Belinda was the coordinator and the years that Rob was the coordinator, it's been hard to get people to take the overnight shifts for two weeks. It's tough. And then it's not cheap. It's expensive. Bethany Lutheran budgets $2,000 to serve meals or breakfasts for the two weeks. And finances are tight for us. And so it just didn't make sense for us to do it. But I was feeling like the Lord was leading us, nudging us to say yes, because there was five weeks at that point that were unscheduled. A church backed out and several other churches that have helped us in the past didn't sign on this year for whatever reason. And so we had five weeks that we didn't have covered. And you know, it's cold. I mean, we're, we've been fortunate that it's been warmer these last few weeks than normal. But it it gets cold and and nobody should be sleeping outside. And so um, we... I polled our leadership team and I polled uh, the, the group of people that help us with the, from the four churches that are my coordinators from each of the four. And we all agreed that we should do it. See, we obeyed the nudging. And as soon as we obeyed the, the nudging... We asked, uh, as soon as we said we would do it, we asked uh, Wicomico Presbyterian Church, whose facility we use, the Langler Memorial Building, if they would make a fifth week. They already had agreed to make four weeks available of using their facility. Those four weeks were covered. The week prior to our first week in their facility was not covered. And so we asked them, would they add that week for their facility because it makes no sense to bring the guys here because we can only host 20 and they can host 38. And I don't want to tell somebody, I'm sorry, we don't have room for you. I mean, we do that when we get the 38 or we when we can't find a room for them. And oftentimes somebody has some place that they could go. But I didn't want to do that and just cut down to 20 people. And so they said, yes, we'll do this. And the amazing thing about this is this is a church that a few years ago, after we hosted there for two weeks, said, we don't really like our facility being used 
in this way. And then I learned that they've been leasing it on Sundays to a Haitian church who they said in these five weeks now can't use it. And they were getting a thousand dollars a month lease money for it. And they're not going to get that because they're going to let the shelter be available to us. And then I had a friend come alongside and say, you know what? There's a granting opportunity, a funding opportunity via a grant. It's usually not made available until June 30. But I got an inside track and I'll, if you complete the application, which I did this week and sent in, we'll review it in early February. And if we feel inclined, we'll give you the money. So pray. I asked for $3,500 because I want to be able to cover the last week of breakfast because Bethany said they only budget it for two weeks. And I get that. And uh, I also want to be able to give a thousand dollars to the church. They're not expecting it. They didn't ask for it, but I want to keep those uh, lines of being able to use their facility open. I want them to feel good about it. And so I put in, I requested $3,500. And then I had a family contact me and say, we want to serve an evening meal two nights as a family. Well, there's two nights out of the seven nights that we took on extra that God provided. They're not associated with any church related to, to the, the, the shelter that does it. And so we will be moving forward on February 22nd through March 14th. Next week, I'll have the sign-up sheets up. Obedience is key to following Jesus. He sees what we cannot, and he moves in mysterious ways when we act in obedience to his call. The second thing worth noting from this interchange between Simon Peter and Jesus is this. After the nets caught so many fish that blew Simon Peter's mind and he realized the greatness of Jesus as if he didn't already realize that. When he realized the greatness of Jesus, he felt that he was unworthy to be around him. And he said to him, he got down on his knees at, at Jesus' feet and said, Jesus, he said, oh Lord, please leave me. I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. But Jesus' response wasn't, yes, get out of here, you are. And then he jumped out of the side of the boat and walked on water to shore because they were out to, to, to see when this happened. Jesus responded to Simon Peter saying, Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And what I want you to hear in this is that no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, you are never outside the reach of God's love and grace. And God can and will use you, even you and me, if you and I are willing to follow and obey Jesus. Did you get that? Listen again. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, you and I are never outside the reach of God's love and grace. And God can and will use you and me if we are willing to follow and obey Jesus. And thirdly, from this passage, Jesus tells us to not be afraid to join him in his mission of fishing for people. And by that, he simply means that our job and the mission that he sends us on is to love people so that they can see Jesus and who he is and fall in love with him. Now, there are two types of callings that all of us, each of us, have in our lives. There's a specific calling and there's a general calling. And you're saying, well, no, duh. <laughs> What other kind would there be, a specific and a general? Well, the specific calling is that you and I are given specific gifts and passions for areas of ministry to be used in a variety of ways to fish for people. Not all of us can stand up here and lead worship. Not all of us can fix a delicious meal. Not all of us have the gift of welcome and hospitality, but some do. And those that have those gifts are called to use them for the mission of Jesus. 
and to use those passions to share his love with other people. And then there's the general calling. All of us are called to represent Jesus and to share his love in any way we can. It's not just my job as a pastor, it's all of our jobs. When we sign on to following Jesus, that's what he's saying to Simon Peter and James and John that day. He's saying, I want you to fish for people. I want you to join me in this mission. And how we do that is unique to each of us. Again, Jesus commands us to not be afraid. It's that fear thing that gets in our way of being on mission for Jesus. We're afraid of what people might think or what they might say. And so we don't share our faith or we don't, we don't act out in a loving way. We don't let people know why we're acting in a loving way because of Jesus, because we're afraid of them. We're afraid of what they might think of us. But here are some ways that all of us or any of us can join in the mission that Jesus calls us to, to love the world, to see him. Maybe you aren't comfortable talking to your friends about their relationship with Jesus. But you know what? We're having a game night on January 25th, 5.30 to 8 p.m. All of you got friends that love to play games. We're doing it here. We're providing pizza. Invite your friends. Tell them, hey, I'm getting together with a bunch of friends from church at church, and we're going to play games. We won't have a hard sell. We won't twist your arm. We won't make you feel uncomfortable. We just like to sit around and eat and play games. We could just as well do it in any one of our living rooms, but none of our living rooms are big enough. That's all you got to tell them. Invite your friends. They'll have a great time. I guarantee and what happens then, then what you do is you pray. You pray for those friends that come and you pray that while they're here, they'll see Jesus. You don't tell them that that's what you're doing. Just pray. Pray that while they're here, they'll see Jesus in us and the way we treat one another and the way we interact with one another. And then pray that they'll be drawn closer to him. Man, that's just easy, right? Okay, so if that's not your thing, here's another one. On, from February 22nd to March 14th, three weeks, 21 days, 21 nights, we will be hosting a shelter. We need lots of help. Lots of people in our community are eager to do something that makes a difference in the lives of others. They often don't know how. We need desserts. We need uh, food. We need snacks. We'll, I'm hoping Lowe's is going to be in. They told me they're in for two weeks. I need to check with the guy and make sure they're in for three weeks because they provide our lunches. And I'm hoping that they are. But if they're not, you know, there's a variety of ways we need help. And just share with your friends. Hey, my church is hosting a homeless shelter. We're doing it at the Langler Memorial Building. We joined together with three other churches. There's four of us. We're very different churches, but we could use some help. Would you like to help me? And then invite them to join you when you come and serve dinner or when you come and prepare dinner or when you bring your snacks or whatever. There's all kinds of ways. And then take it one step further. Pray that while they're there serving, that they will see Jesus and be drawn to him. It's a recurring prayer. Okay, if that doesn't work, let me just, um, I've, I got lots of ideas for you this morning. Because this is a calling that all of us have. In 2020, this year, we're going to return to the Be a Blessing Sundays. We let them go in 2019 because a couple of reasons. One is the attendance at the Be a Blessing Sundays was waning. We sensed there was a lack of enthusiasm for them for some reason. Maybe you didn't like the projects. Maybe you didn't feel it was worthwhile. I, I don't know. I mean, there's a seems to be a lack of enthusiasm for the church right now, too. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, maybe that's some of it. But then the other reason that we let it go was that we didn't, we weren't, we, we were struggling financially. And we said, okay, the Be a Blessing Sundays are four Sundays that our offering is cut like in half. Because even though we advertise and say, bring your offering, it doesn't happen or, or the, we don't have the same crowd. And so we were struggling and we said, let's just hold off. Maybe we will take a, a rest, a Sabbath year. We've been doing it for like 
eight years and uh, let's take a rest. And so while we were resting, some of you kept saying to our leadership team, hey, we want this back. We miss it. It's who we are. Uh, uh, it's me. It's this mic. Uh, but I don't know what it's going to. So anyhow, um, they uh, they said we need to do it again. And so we decided, yep, we are. Well, it's a perfect opportunity to invite your unchurched friends to. You can say, hey, we're not having a worship service. We won't make you feel uncomfortable. But we're doing things on Sunday. And I think we're going to do it three times next year because the fourth sun, the time, every, the time there's a fifth Sunday, the fourth time in a year is like this year. It's December 29th or whatever, like this year was. And that's just a bad Sunday to, to do it. Uh, but every time there's a fifth Sunday in a month, we will do it at least three times next year. And we'll have projects inside and outside. And you just tell your friends, Hey, come along and be a part of this effort to make a difference in our community. We always try to do something that would bless somebody else. That's why it's called Be a Blessing Sunday. We don't have worship. We meet at nine and we end with a meal together. And so it's a beautiful time. And there's a great way to invite someone who is not church to join you in that effort. And then a final way. Actually, it's not a final way because... and. uh in the first service when I preached this, I had a, I came up with another way that I want to share. So this is a next to the last way that you can join Jesus in the mission that he uh, calls us on. And um, I don't have her permission to share this, but she shared it publicly on Facebook. And so uh, many of you have already seen it. But uh, there are ways that you can use Facebook for the good, for the mission of Jesus. And you can share posts that we post on our church uh, Facebook page. You can share sermons. You can share activities that we're doing and make a personal comment. And lately, I've been noticing that Tammy Brown has been doing a phenomenal job of doing that. I just went back this morning and captured four of the times in December that she did this. On December 28th, she posted this. She tagged Community of Joy's Facebook page and she said, stopped at Community of Joy to pick up my crock pot from Christmas Eve service. The praise band is sounding good. Tomorrow morning's service is 10.30 a.m. That's painless. It's easy. It's simple. On Thursday of this last week, I shared this with a picture of the sign that's out front. I said, a new year brings thoughts of new practices and routines. For most people, church might not be on the list. And we understand why not. But at Community of Joy, you won't find any finger pointing or pushing you down. You will find a group of ordinary people who love Jesus and strive to share his love in a multitude of tangible and no strings attached ways in our community and, we, and world. We don't have all the answers and we don't pretend to either. We're on an adventure together to be the church Jesus wants us to be as agents of love and blessing in the world. We would welcome you to join us Sundays at 9 or 1030. And then as you feel able in the variety of ways that we seek to make a difference in our community. Hope to see you Sunday. And then Tammy shared that and said, I love what Pastor Martin Hutchison shared below. It's true. I'll also add, if you haven't been in a while, I can guarantee you you will have multiple people excited to see you and give you a big old hug. How easy is that? Now, some of you don't have Facebook and that's fine. But those of you who do, it's a great way to do it. And so at the, in the first service, they said, well, maybe we don't have the words that Tammy has, you know. So just say, I love this about my church and share it. But don't just share, don't, don't just share it. Put some personal something because when you just share something, most people don't look at it, but when you put a personal stamp on it, it goes a lot further. Then on the 25th, after the Christmas Eve service, Tammy shared, I love when you go into something thinking about, uh, thinking you will bless others, but you always receive a blessing. Christmas Eve is a family gathering tradition for us, but we were able to be part of this gathering. And I, she shared the the write-up I did about our Christmas Eve experience. We were able to be a part of this gathering in other ways. 
So happy to hear that everyone had a great time together. Merry Christmas to all. And then probably the most beautiful one she did on the 19th, right before our Christmas Eve service, she shared uh, this with her folks. She tagged me and the church and said, good morning, everyone. I'd planned on going off Facebook until New Year, uh, but just uh, just a little social media break. But here I am because I feel like I'm supposed to share this opportunity to be part of our small church with a big heart. Plan to do, be something different on Christmas Eve for a group of people that are sometimes left out of the good things in life. Celebrating Christmas Eve with people you do life worth with. And she shared my sermon on yielding. And she said, if you watch to the end of this video, and she gave the timestamp 32.44, you'll see what, I, what we are doing this year. I know my people, she says, meaning her friends, like to give back. So I'm just going to put it out there so you know the need in case you can. The gathering is December 24th at 4 p.m. Thanks for considering. Merry Christmas. And then she did a list of the things that we needed yet for Christmas Eve for that feast. And I can't tell you how many of her friends responded. I knew when I saw her post, they would, because they always do. They love Tammy. And they love the things, the adventures that she gets them into. And it was fun that week as she would text me and say, hey, so-and-so is bringing this and so-and-so is bringing that. Sorry to keep bothering you, but I'm excited. So-and-so is bringing that. And then that night she walked in and brought all of the gifts, the things, the food that her friends couldn't uh, bring. And she couldn't stay, but she said, I was so glad I could come in and see what was going on. So see, it's that simple, brothers and sisters. Now for the last thing that you can do, and we need to do better at this. If you look around, there's a whole bunch of people who sometimes are here who aren't right now. Reach out to them. Hey, so-and-so, I'm missing you. Everything okay? We need to do that. It can't just be Sharon and I. It needs to come from us. And that's easy because you know them, Right? We do church together. We do life together. We're on mission together. So if you, can't, if you don't have any friends that you can invite to Jesus and, and, and to church and to see who Jesus is, you, you got these people that are family, that aren't here, that are hurting, that are struggling, reach out to them. And if you don't know how to reach out to them, reach out to me and I'll give you an email or I'll give you a cell phone number. Or, uh, you could use Facebook message, Messenger. Don't put it on a Facebook post. Don't call them out. That won't work well but you can reach out to them through Messenger, which is private, and say, hey, we're missing you. And I should say that those two posts that I did before and after the Christmas Eve gathering were shared countless times, and my Facebook and uh, those of us who are administrators on the church page get to see how many people it touched. It touched 3,695 people. Those two posts. Because the work of Christmas begins now and depends on us, we must follow Jesus. He may ask us to do something that we don't understand or think is possible in our small minds, but the key to following Jesus is obedience. And as we honor his, as we obey him, he will honor our obedience in ways that humble us and blow our minds. All of us are worthy of serving Jesus, of following Jesus. And he calls all of us to fish for people by loving on them and pointing them to him. And so my question for you today is will you follow Jesus in 2020? And no, I'm not asking you if you'll embrace the label. I'm asking you if you'll follow him. If you'll obey when you feel his nudging to reach out to somebody, to share a, a, a loving gesture or an act of love in a tangible way. 